wow, this is really risky. I think every Canadian who works hard for their whole life should be able to retire at some point, especially because nearly every single Canadian is required to pay thousands of dollars each year into a forced retirement fund. But after a recent government announcement, a big change could be coming that might put these funds at risk, no matter if you're young or old. Now, let me explain what's going on and how it could impact you directly. You might already be familiar with the Canada Pension Plan, or the CPP. Now, like most pensions, workers and employers will regularly pay into the fund each paycheck, and then once a Canadian reaches a certain age and retires, they get a monthly payment that's supposed to help support the retirement. Now, it's not an insignificant amount of money, it's usually between an extra $5,000 and $15,000 per year for retirees. But recently, the government came across a problem, and they announced that they want to make what some people are calling a dangerous change to the pensions rules in order to help solve their big problem. But it could put Canadians' retirement funds at risk in doing so. Now, this change doesn't just apply to the public Canadian pension plan, the CPP, but it also applies to the other plans that many Canadians pay into, like uh, OMERS or the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. We said that we were committed as a government to working collaboratively with Canada's pension funds to help them find more opportunities to invest here in Canada, our remarkable country. What exactly is she talking about and, and why do some think that it could be putting Canadian retirement funds at risk? Well, in order to understand what this change means for you, first you need to understand the disastrous situation that these pensions found themselves in not too long ago, and the big changes that were made to fix it. Back in 1996, the future Prime Minister, then Finance Minister, Paul Martin, realized that the Canada Pension Plan was set to collapse and run out of money by 2006. He said, and I quote, The problems facing the Canada Pension Plan are fundamental. The chief actuary of the plan has shown that without changes, the CPP fund will run out of money in less than 20 years. Now this scared a lot of Canadians who had been forced to pay into the pension plan since it was created in the 1960s, realizing that without a change, they might not actually see any of the money that they were told they were entitled to. And it was all because of a number of problems. See if any of these sound familiar to you. There were not enough working age people contributing to the pension relative to Canada's growing aging population. And the glut of new retirees were also living for longer and having fewer children than before, resulting in even fewer new workers to help pay for their retirements. Now, on top of all of that, inflation had increased the cost of living and uh, the payments that people were receiving from the plan just weren't keeping up. It kind of sounds eerily similar to a lot of the issues that we're facing today, doesn't it? Now, we'll get into that in, in just a minute. So in the same speech, Paul Martin went on with his solutions. He said, Canadians have asked their government, first, to preserve the Canada Pension Plan, second, to strengthen its financing, and third, to improve the fund's investment practices and reduce its costs. In other words, they said, do not tinker with the CPP, make sure it's there for us, and this is exactly what we have done. It essentially breaks down into two different solutions, the first one being getting working-aged Canadians to pay more, which they did. Uh, by 2003, the percentage Canadians needed to pay into the fund increased from 3.6% where it started to 9.9% of pensionable income. So even if we can't grow the population fast enough to support it, we'll just have the people that are here pay a whole heck of a lot more. Now the second part is critical to what's happening today, so remember this. In order to make the contributions to the Canada Pension Plan last, they realized they wouldn't be able to just chuck their billions of dollars into a savings account. That would be a surefire way to reduce the purchasing power of that money as a result of the effects of inflation. No way were they going to do that. Instead, they created the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, an organization that's independent from but accountable to the Canadian government. Now, it was the CPP Investment Board's job to invest the assets they received, the, the dollars from Canadians like you and me, with the goal of growing Canadians' contributions dramatically so that they wouldn't face another pension crisis situation where the money would run out. In fact, the formal mandate of the investment board, right from the act that created the board, is to invest its assets with a view of achieving a maximum rate of return, maximum rate of return, remember that, without undue risk of loss, having regard to the factors that may affect the funding of the Canada Pension Plan and the ability of the Canada Pension Plan to meet its financial obligations on any given day. 
Essentially, the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board's mandate is to get the best return on your retirement money without being too risky with it. That's what they mean here by the maximum rate of return. That's their whole goal. And they've done a pretty good job of that. This is their 2023 end of year report and they show some averages on how much they've earned for their investors over the past number of years. Their 10 year average is 10% per year of growth in their investments. Over the past five years, it's been a little lower at 8% and last year in 2023, they only got 1.4%, which is kind of understandable given the downturn we saw in the economy and many investments. And this is all net returns, which means this is the growth of the fund after they've subtracted all of the salaries of the investment board's analysts, managers, and executives. And that includes the CEO who makes a whopping $5.4 million a year. But even with the mass amount of yearly new contributions to the pension fund, they need to make a pretty damn good return to remain sustainable over the long term to prevent the collapse of the fund and to support the millions of Canadians who are currently paying into the system once they they reach retirement. In 2021, Canada's chief actuary, which is just a fancy name for a person who runs a bunch of math and does a bunch of models um, and is independent from any political party, well, the chief actuary said that the CPP will only remain sustainable over the next 75 years if they're able to achieve an average annual return of 3.69%, but that's 3.69% above whatever inflation is in Canada. This is something called the real rate of return, and it's a helpful number to look at because if you make 5% on your investments in a year, but at the same time, everything that you're needing to buy goes up 5%, well, then you're not really getting ahead, are you? The real rate of return is whatever investment gains you make, and you subtract the amount of inflation that you've seen over the same period. And over the past while, they've actually been able to achieve over 3.27% real returns, which is needed to support the CPP so that it can actually pay out everybody. Over the past 10 years, they've done 6.6% on average. I remember that's after inflation. Over the past five years, 4.1% returns on the money that we're all paying into the pension plan. But in 2023, the one year that they've conveniently omitted here, um, it wasn't as good. They only made 1.4% on their money, and that's not a real return. When we account for inflation, um, which the annual average for inflation was 3.9%, uh, look at this nice handwriting, in 2023, well, that shows a real return of a loss of 2.5%, if my math's right. But that's just one year, and if you look at their long-term averages, they have been hitting this target, and it's a very good thing that they have because it's super important that they do so. But this is where the government's latest announcement could impact things in a very big way as they seek to change the rules, incentivizing these big pension plans across the country to forego their mandate of investing in a way that will result in the best risk-adjusted returns. Remember we said the CPP needs to look for returns as their primary motivator. Now, instead, the government is trying to tell them that they should be forced to invest more heavily in Canadian companies, even if it means that diminishes their returns. Now, the government first laid out their plans to make this change last year in the 2023 budget that came out last April. Um, they, they say it right here that the federal government will work collaboratively with Canadian pension funds to create an environment that encourages and identifies more opportunities for investments in Canada by pension funds and by other responsible investment pools while helping to deliver secure pensions for Canadians. But the conversation has bubbled up even more lately due to the upcoming 2024 budget, uh, alongside pressure from some of Canada's top CEOs who actually wrote an open letter directly to the finance minister, Christian Freeland, uh, asking her to make this change, make the pension funds invest in Canadian companies, something that, as we saw in the budget from last year, she's already indicated she wants to do. This is the letter that a bunch of Canada's biggest CEOs have all put their name on, and they're kind of pissed off. They're saying Canadian pension funds have reduced their holdings of Canadian companies from 28% of all of the things that they own uh, by at the end of 2000 to less than 4% at the end of 2023. They go on to say that the government has the right, responsibility, and obligation to regulate how this savings regime, regime the Canada Pension Plan, operates. 
Now, one important note that they bring up in this open letter that we've talked a lot about on the channel before is Canada's faltering economy, at least in terms of GDP per capita. Uh, now, GDP per capita is a very simple thing. Uh, instead of looking at the normal GDP or gross domestic product, the, the total amount of goods and services sold nationwide, instead of looking at only that as an indicator of the economy, it's often a lot more helpful to look at this on a per person basis to get a better idea of how the economy is actually serving the people inside of it. Now, the GDP per person or the GDP divided by the amount of people in Canada tells an entirely different story. Uh, while the GDP in Canada has been increasing over the past number of years, the GDP per person has been decreasing, which is a telltale marker of a decreasing quality of life for the average Canadian. This is why a lot of Canadians are wondering or are feeling like uh, their quality of life is going down but they're seeing the GDP, the economy number, go up. Well, the GDP per capita more closely uh, uh, reflects your personal experience, I think. And these CEOs rightly point out how Canada's falling behind. They say Canada's gross domestic product per capita has fallen from 95% of what the U.S. had uh, to 75% of the U.S.'s GDP per capita. We're falling behind the states. And non-residential investment per worker in Canada is less than half of that of the United States. That's removing the amount that Canadians invest in housing. Uh, for every dollar Canadians invest in startups, the United States invests $40 for every one Canadian dollar. So these CEOs of some of Canada's biggest corporations think that by getting these big pension funds with hundreds of billions of dollars to their name to invest in Canadian businesses more heavily, that it will help Canada increase their GDP per capita and the quality of life for average Canadians. They think that by doing this, that Canadian businesses will do better overall, and as a result, the pension funds, too, will make bigger and better returns. Uh, it would mean more jobs created by heavier investment in Canada, and some would say it would mean higher wages for Canadians as a result of a cheaper cost of capital for businesses, and this would all be happening while supporting and growing Canada's retirement money. That's exactly what all of the CEOs who wrote their name on this letter to Freeland think. And here's a clip from Peter Letko, who's the CEO of an investment firm that was the one that actually wrote and sponsored this letter. There's a big multiplier effect. And pension funds, pension fund managers don't see that. They don't look at that. But that's definitely the most positive way to frame all of this. Now, take a look at this. This is what some of the pension fund managers have to say. Um, the managers of the uh, Canada Pension Plan say that the only reason that they've been so successful is because they have the utmost clarity in our singular focus on achieving financial returns for the people who give us their money for their retirement security. One of the other largest pension plans in Canada that would also be affected by this, OMERS, went on to say that any attempt to mandate investments in certain prescribed asset classes or components of our economy would limit our flexibility and make it extremely difficult to continue to deliver on our pension promise. So forcing more investment into Canadian companies does come with some risks to the returns on Canadians' retirement money. But maybe it's worth the risk if it means increasing the GDP per capita for Canadians and as a result, their quality of life. But why aren't Canadian companies and investments attractive to these funds in the first place? Like, why aren't they investing in Canada anyways? They're investing in other places. Why not invest here? What's the problem? Well, the leader of the Conservative Party, Pierre Polyev, has some thoughts, but he doesn't give a clear stance on whether or not he would force the pension, pun pension funds to invest in Canada, but he does say that all of this is just a symptom of a much bigger problem. The government has to get out of the way for entrepreneurs and workers to grow the economy. We have a gatekeeper economy today where we have the second slowest permits in the OECD, um, that means that capital has to sit on the sidelines for years while it waits for, to get a maybe out of the regulators. In many cases, this just means that capital doesn't sit on the sidelines, it leaves. We have 800,000, sorry, 800 billion more Canadian dollars invested abroad than the world invests in Canada. So what's happening, you know, there's this debate now about whether Canadian pension funds should be encouraged to invest more in Canada. Well. The question is, why aren't they doing it without government encouragement? The answer is because the governments have made this an uninvestable country. 
where you can't get anything done. It's it just, it, it, whether it's like a, a small business that's trying to get a permit to expand by an extra thousand feet, square feet, or a pipeline, or a mine, uh, or a housing development, uh, this is a nation in waiting. And in this recent article, which is great, by Barbara Schechter uh, from the Financial Post, she points to a history of Canada not being a very stable place to invest for the types of investments that these giant funds want to make. Um, the, the fund managers say there's not the opportunities because the things like toll roads, ports, airports, they're taken out of the equation, or the rules aren't reliable, and that's why they're not investing here. There aren't the opportunities that people feel safe and comfortable to make. Now these toll roads and airports, big infrastructure like this, these are the types of big investments that pension funds want to make. They just have so much money that they need to deploy um, that trying to buy public infrastructure, going to the government and saying, hey, can I buy this toll road from you? Can I buy this uh, airport from you? It's an attractive uh, offering to them. Uh, on top of it, they also get the bonus that these assets actually have an operating income via airport landing fees and tolls on roads, a little bit better than some of these sort of uh, stock or equity investments that are their other options. Now, during Justin Trudeau's tenure, uh, some of the biggest funds have tried to buy Canada's largest public airports, but after initially open, opening up talks with the pension funds, uh, the Liberals made a little bit of a, an about face and cancelled any further talks. They were worried that allowing a publicly owned airport to be sold would lose them too many voters as many Canadian citizens might not be in favour of the idea. So instead, the CPP Investment Board went abroad, investing in things like office towers in Sydney, Australia, uh, South Korean discount retail stores, and, and uh, toll roads in Chicago, just to name a few. Now, I don't really know where I stand on this entirely. I see the benefits and the downsides. Now, initially, allowing an airport to be sold by the government would give the government a big surplus of money that they could spend on whatever they see fit, uh, hopefully paying down their deficit a little bit. Uh, but would Canadians that actually use these airports and toll roads be taken advantage of if they were sold to a private owner? I certainly wouldn't be in favor of them selling it off to any random overseas bidder, but if it's a Canadian pension fund that makes the purchase and makes the money off of the roads and the airports, well, supporting the retirement of Canadian citizens in the process, well, then maybe that makes a little bit more sense. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, let me know by leaving a comment. Either way, even when the government has offered up the sale of giant public infrastructure, the investors have often been blindsided and kind of screwed. This is a situation that happened about 20 years ago where a pension plan, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, uh, bought a, a part of Alberta's uh, electricity infrastructure, like delivering electricity to Albertan homes. Um, but after the deal closed, the province came back and said, hey, now that you own this, we're going to change the way that you charge for electricity change the rates that you can charge for it and as a result the returns that they projected for the asset that they purchased uh, were cut in half. So all of this is part of the reason that funds don't want to invest in Canada in the first place. It's not seen as as stable. Uh, governments can change their mind and change the deal that you made retroactively. So maybe it's not about forcing funds to invest where they don't want to. And maybe instead it's more about making Canada a more attractive place to invest. Either way, this letter from the CEOs uh, to try to get this pension plan money, it kind of rubs me the wrong way. I, I don't think these CEOs really care about what they claim they care about, average Canadian citizens increasing GDP per capita. They make their arguments in ways that frame their suggestions as a benefit to Canadians, but what it really would do is probably benefit the share price of their companies, something that I'm guessing many of the CEOs have their big bonuses tied to. They claim that it would support more job creation, but it feels like just another government handout, except a little bit different this time. Instead of using the money that we pay the government in taxes each year to help out their corporate buddies, this time they're tapping into our retirement plans to do so. I mean, just look at what happened earlier this year. The government gave about $40 million in regulatory relief to Bell Media, who owns many local news stations across the country, to help them support this struggling local media industry. But shortly after they got this $40 million in, in relief, well, they laid off nearly 5,000 of their local news workers. So much for creating jobs. Uh, here's what Trudeau responded with. What is your view of that company's layoffs and what is your commitment to future government support with that company? 
I'm furious. This is a garbage decision by a corporation that should know better. So Trudeau acts mad for a week or so, and then everyone stops talking about it. And I, if there's anything I've learned lately through making these videos, is that it seems like the biggest corporations always win. It really makes you wonder who really controls the country, and if the redirection of our retirement money would really create jobs, or if it would just contribute to CEO bonuses and a wider wage gap between a company's workers and their executives and shareholders. Now, the next thing we need to look out for to see the outcome of this story is the new federal budget, uh, something Christian Freeland will be releasing on the April 16th that explains where Canada is going to be spending its money and, and what changes they're going to be making. I, I expect to see some more details in there outlining how she'd like to change the rules to make Canadian investments more attractive to Canadian pension funds, even if it means a reduction in those funds' returns. And we can't forget that your contributions and your employer's contributions to the Canadian Pension Plan are 100% mandatory. You can't opt out of it even if you wanted to, which in my eyes is a little bit problematic in and of itself. There's no guarantee that these pension funds will meet the investment goals, that 3.7 real rate of return that they need in order to honor the program for future retirees. And I think that's part of the reason Canada is also so actively trying to grow its population faster than any other G7 country. Mass population growth means more workers to contribute to the pension fund, kicking the can further down the road, right? If we can't get there via investment returns, well, we'll just add more people just like they did in the... Uh, in the 19 or 1997, uh, add more people or make those people pay more into the program, just kick the can down the road, someone else will deal with it. I think it's also part of the reason that there are corporate elite who are actively lobbying the government for this population growth through programs like this one, the Century Initiative. Now, if you haven't heard of the Century Initiative, uh, it's a government lobbyist group who seeks to influence Canadian politicians to have them target a Canadian population of 100 million Canadians, up from the current 41 million uh, Canadians that there are currently in Canada. And they want to do this, this uh, 60 million million person increase by the year 2100. Now, why exactly do they want to do this? Well, they list a bunch of reasons here that sound good at first glance, but as you look closer, it seems like it would actually help politicians and corporations more than it would help average Canadians. Uh, take a look at this. They say, we've got to have more people because our population's aging, the workforce participation is shrinking, there's so many seniors, people aren't having enough children, uh, and we need more people to support our growing population, our growing uh, seniors' population. I'd attribute the lack in fertility to the, the increased cost of living in Canada. It's pretty expensive to have a kid, um, but I digress. We'll keep on going. They say economic growth is tied to population growth. If we have 100 million people, our, our GDP growth will be at 2.6% instead of 1.6%. Uh, um, again, they're looking at the GDP number, not the GDP per person. It seems like they're targeting this GDP number that politicians can wave around and say, look how well we're doing doing uh, and, and look how good these companies are doing our economy is growing when in reality the GDP per person the money that people have the people's quality of life is diminishing and the third point here is that anyone who uh, detracts against this hey they have anti-immigrant sentiment they're they're uh, they're racist this is the kind of messaging that we're getting from this initiative but my concerns about this initiative uh, start to sound a little bit less tinfoil hatty when you look at who started the initiative. The, these are the two um, the two co-founders of the Century Initiative. The first one is Mark Wiseman, who, hmm, this is interesting, is the former CEO of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. We'll get back to that. The other uh, co-founder of this is Dominic Barton, who's Trudeau's former ambassador to China, as well as the chair of McKinsey, which is a consulting firm that gets a lot of corporate contracts from the big companies in Canada uh, and globally, as well as governments around the world will often hire McKinsey to come in and, and help them out in whatever way. Now, call me crazy if you want to, 
But could it possibly be that Mark Wiseman in, in the Canada Pension Plan, former CEO, worries that the Canada Pension Plan won't be sustainable unless we add tens of millions of new workers in a giant population Ponzi scheme that he hopes to kick down the road, uh, right? Like, obviously, increasing the population would help out with any CPP issues that he could see coming. Uh, on the other hand, here with Barton, could it potentially be that Barton wants more workers for cheap labor to help the share prices of the companies that hire McKinsey, uh, while also at the same time increasing the tax base and the tax revenue that governments can get because there's more people in the country, um, the same governments that also pay McKinsey for their consulting services. I don't know, this is all speculation, but you can see why I start to question if the Century Initiative is really serving the best interests of Canadians, and if the CPP is truly sustainable and will be reliable in the future for the Canadians who are paying into it now. And about this whole debate on if we should force pension funds to, to invest in Canada, what about this? Instead of altering how pension funds need to invest in, here in Canada, what if they instead reduced the amount that Canadians and employers have to contribute to the Canada Pension Plan? Uh, we'd be able to keep more of our own money, um, so while simultaneously reducing the amount that we're paid out in retirement, and instead educating Canadians and making them more financially literate and responsible for their own savings and their investing. Now, this could be, admittedly, a recipe for disaster if a basic investing knowledge isn't prioritized in the school system and, and people could fail to save for their retirement, uh, uh, resulting in an overflow of old age assistance programs uh, as a result, which, which could be a big problem if people don't have the Canada Pension Plan. But in a best case scenario, Canadians could have the autonomy of where their money goes and, and how it gets invested. Who knows, maybe this could even look like a forced savings investment account where instead of paying the salaries of pension fund managers by contributing to the CPP, uh, you were forced to invest the same amount of money in an account that you yourself controlled. Uh, some sort of TFSA-like account where employees contribute and their employers match those con contributions, just like the CPP. Uh, you'd then be able to choose what those funds are invested in. I don't know, something just irks me about the centralized control of having a small group of people uh, control all of our money that's all in one place and uh, making all the decisions about where it goes. I don't know, maybe they should even open up the criteria for accredited investors in Canada. Um, like right now, average Canadians can't invest in small companies and startups, things like that. But if you were to loosen these rules and allow more funds to flow into these early stage startups, uh, either via angel investing or easier access to venture capital funds that invest in early stage companies. Uh, maybe all of this would support new entrepreneurs and uh, as a result, potentially increase the country's GDP per capita through the growth of new and emergent businesses. But who knows, maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm way off on this. I am just a guy, like I always say, trying to put together the pieces here like anyone else, anyone who's watching this video, but I'm just sharing my thoughts along the way as I do so. Uh, but I am curious in what you think about all this. What have I gotten right? What have I gotten wrong? Uh, do you think it makes sense to force our retirement savings more heavily into Canadian companies and, and investing in them? Or do you think that it uh, should be more of the goal, like how it was originally created, uh, that the CPP and the other pension funds should be only seeking the best returns so that the pensions will be there for Canadians in the future. Let me know what you think down in the comments, but one thing is for certain in my mind, and that's that there's no guarantee that the government will be there for you when you need it, or that they'll even keep their long-term promises. Things can change, and they can't, they change extremely quickly, right? Uh, I think that you should do your best to make sure you're saving for retirement yourself. Better yet, look at investing a little bit each month into a well-diversified index ETF, perhaps inside of a tax-free savings account, and holding that over the long term. Um, just a starting point for you to look into. Nobody's going to take care of you and your family. Nobody's going to do that except for you. That's how I'm planning for me, my life, and my family going forward. And I think it's a good idea for you to do the same. But with all that said, thanks so much for watching this video. If you haven't already done so, subscribe.
subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to support the channel, this independent channel, and you want to see more of it, then you can check out the links in the description uh, and uh, even consider buying me a beer or a coffee at the link below. Any little bit helps out and goes a long way. Uh, subscribe to the email list where I send out all the sources for these videos as I make them, if you haven't already done so. Uh, but again, thanks so much for watching this video. I hope it helped you out at least a little bit, and I'll see you next time.